All right, we're going to give everybody a minute to jump in. Welcome, everybody. Let me know where you are viewing from. We are going to get it going in just one moment. From Mafia Mondays over here. Pizzagate and heroin. You guys ready? Let's just get it started. Let's just get it on. Pull in. The truth, the truth, set the truth, set you free, set you free. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Special New Monday thing I'm doing here, Mafia Mondays. We are going to bring you the hits, the, the history. Of universal deceit. deceit. Telling the truth, Telling the truth is a revolutionary act. A revolutionary act. The bosses and the boroughs that made the Sicilian Mafia the force and that it is today. And we're going to start with some of the history tonight, guys. We're going to take you a little bit back in time to where the American Mafia was born. We're going to take you through history, and we're going to teach you a little something about the mob, my friends, so welcome, benvenuto, benvenuto, all right, here we go, always good to see everybody here, welcome, welcome, welcome to Mafia Mondays, how you's doing? All right, this is episode one, Pizzagate and Heroin. And when I say Pizzagate, I mean the original Pizzagate, the OG Pizzagate, the pizza connection. The Sicilian heroin smuggling, man, we got stuff to talk about in here. So welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Veritas Machine. Let me know where you are in from. Always good to have you over here from Cold Beer. All the Meat Hammer Nation in the house. In the house. Meat hammers in the hell. I can't help it. I cannot help but to do Mark, Mike, whatever. I don't even know his name anymore. Anyway, uh, some great stories that we'll have tonight. Always enjoy watching him. I hope everybody is having a great evening. But I got to tell you, we're going to take it in a little bit different direction over here. All right. So. Uh, if you like mafia stories, clap your hands. If you like mafia stories, clap your hands. All right, welcome. Hey, what's going on, Will? CBC Media, CBC Media in the house. In the house, Shaw Kroger in the house. Uh, Crippler Grayson, Australia in the house. <laughs> All right, so over the next few weeks uh, on, on Mondays, we are going to cover all things Mafia. Uh, again, we are going to go over the history, the hits, the bosses, and the boroughs that made mob history. Now, we're going to get into a little part of the story right now. One of the original players, one of the original families, one of the OG families. Now, first of all, you 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 all know the American mafia, Gambinos, uh, that came over from Sicily, right? And they did their thing. You know uh, John Gotti. You know people like that, right? However, the real deal, the real gangsters, the guys that run the shit for real are in Sicily. And we're going to show you a little bit of history of Palermo here. Now, this is, uh, I'm going to show you the, um, at the end of this video, you'll see where this um, video came from. So you'll be able to see the whole series. But uh, hey, look at that. I got a background now. Uh, so here we go. Coincidentally, as our agents, everybody hears cafe, that, right? The entertainment had just ended. So as we broke in, applause broke out. All right. That is the Sicilian flag. This is <clears throat> part one of the Cherry Hill Gambinos. You guys are going to like this.
Carlo Gambino's family was infused with blood relatives, but none were more mysterious and shadowy than the Cherry Hill Gambinos. Headed by Carlo's cousin John Gambino, the savvy and charismatic Sicilian had one foot in the U.S. and the other in Italy and became the monumental bridge for drug trafficking between the two countries. Don Carlo and the rest of La Cosa Nostra might have put a ban on that type of infamia, but it was a lucrative business that made billions. And John was at the top of that lucrative totem pole. And this is uh, this is heroin, okay? This is not this is not just like some weed uh, stuff. This is the international heroin smuggling market. Oh, Giovanni John Gambino was born on August twenty second, nineteen forty, in Palermo, Sicily. He was the first in his immediate family to arrive in the U.S. and came to the country illegally. In 1958, he was arrested as an illegal alien and deported. A short time later, he returned hey, to the U.S. Doing? and married his been? cousin, who was an American citizen and coincidentally also a Gambino. John himself would become a U.S. citizen in 1964. John's father was Tommaso Gambino, who owned a butcher shop in Italy and was a first cousin to Don Carlo. When Tommaso came to the U.S. in 1964, he settled in Brooklyn with his wife, who was a Spatola. Tommaso was also a close friend and associate of Tommaso Buscetta, a member of the Porto Nuovo Pipo Calos family of the Sicilian Mafia. Okay, so Tommaso Buscetta, uh, these are the guys that I'm talking about. These are the real um, heads of even the, uh, the American Mafia families. Okay, the five boroughs in New York, um, Midwest, South, you know, New Orleans, uh, etc. Uh, you would uh, really see a lot of their influence when we get further into the series. We're going to cover a whole bunch of stuff on the new, on the uh, non, um, Camorra and different kinds of mafia that exist now in Italy and Sicily. And these are the guys that run the whole show. Okay. <laughs> the, the yeah, the, the Busqueta is delicious. Who made headlines when he turned against his family <laughs> in the highly publicized pizza connection and Mexi trial cases in the 1980s. John had two brothers, Giuseppe, also known as Joe, and Rosario, also known as Sal. He also had a sister, Giovanna. Joanne. Now I'm I'm Italian and I don't know where they get Sal from Rosario. Um still haven't figured that one out. Working on it. Who would eventually marry Erasmo Gambino, who would be a player in John's drug business. When John first arrived in the US, he the resided in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. In 1972, his brothers, father, and sister had moved to Dalran, New Jersey, where the brothers set up base as the Cherry Hill Gambinos. Now, Cherry Hill is right across the bridge from my hometown of Philadelphia. So don't think that uh, you didn't run into these people all the time uh, coming across the bridge. Uh, it just so happened that it was a battle of, uh, of the how high the hair was uh, on the girls back in the 80s between Jersey and South Philly. <laughs> so you would get some teased up hair. Man, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I mean, it was like it was unbelievable, defied gravity. John stayed behind in Brooklyn. Later, he lived in Bay Ridge and also owned a home in Milford, Pennsylvania, near John Gotti's estate, and also had properties in Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, and Florida. Hmm. According to law enforcement, John was a man of honor in the Sicilian Mafia, Newark. affiliated oh, yeah. with you the know. Inzerillo, Gambina, Spatola, and DiMaggio clan, also known as the Paso di Rigano family, Oops. and was inducted into the Gambino family in 1976 under Paul Castellano. In 1986, Big Paulie Castellano. he was promoted to capo by John Gotti and was put in charge of the family Sicilian faction, which had previously been headed by Antonino Nino in Zerillo. However, according to LCN Bios, former Gambino... Uh, Paulie Castellano was killed by uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano... And uh, John Gotti was driving the car in front of Sparks Steakhouse um, uh, in, I believe it was 82, Angelo Bruno. It was Angelo Bruno in Philly. And then 
Big Pauly Castellano in New York, uh, and Sammy the Bull uh, was the shooter, uh, along with a couple other guys. And they dressed up in the it was Christmas time, and they dressed up in the tan coats with the Russian hats on, and they went and they uh, they killed uh, Tommy Bellotti and uh, Pauly Castellano, uh, aka Big Pauly, uh, who then a big power shift. And that's when John Gotti stepped in as uh, as the boss. And Sammy the Bull became the underboss of the New York Gambino crew. But later on, this is this is early. This is the early history of uh, some of the mafia power. Bino underboss turned informant Sammy Gravano testified that after Ingerlo's exactly murder right? in 1981, hate Castellano Ashbury. had transferred John to James Jimmy Brown Fiala's crew. Later, John Haight Ashbury being the uh, intersection of streets in San Francisco, uh, where the hippie movement uh, took off the tune in, turn on, and drop out uh, thing happen. If you're going to San Francisco, make sure you wear flowers in your hair. Because John was transferred to Tommy Bellotti's crew and stayed there <laughs> until he and Castellano were murdered in 1985. Ashbury. In 1983, New Jersey police had identified Fiala as a capo in the North Jersey Fort Lee crew. It had also identified both John and Nino Enzarillo as capos of the South Jersey crew. John Gambino was considered a loyal of Castellano, and it was believed that after Castellano was murdered, he was going to seek revenge against Gotti and that Gotti was going to kill John as a preventative measure. But Gambino had a stroke, which calmed things down a bit since he was out of action. However, when he was well enough to return to business, this is when John Gotti reportedly promoted him to capo. He eventually became boss of 18th Avenue in Brooklyn until he was jailed in 1994 Okay, a lot of a lot of people see that. I'm gonna go back just a little bit right here because a lot of people see this footage. Okay, when you when you talk about John Gotti, okay, this by the way is uh, that's how Polly Castellano ended up. <coughs> and uh, let me tell you something: that guy didn't even make it to his steak dinner. A Um. So here we go now. He was going to seek revenge against right. Gotti Check and that Gotti was going to kill John as a preventative this measure. This footage, okay, see now there, right, walking with him, that is Sammy the Bull next to him. I I would imagine that... But Gambino had a stroke, which calmed things down a bit since he was out of action. However, when he was well enough... I don't know who's that, Tony Spilatro or uh, Quack Quack or one of those guys... Uh, we'll get into all those names and, and all the history of this and what I'm talking about through the, through this series of Mafia Mondays. So make sure you hit that like button, right? If you're in here and you're digging this, if you like a good mob story, it's going to get even better now. Uh, right here, this is footage out in front of what's called the Ravenite Social Club. It was in Little Italy on Mulberry Street, uh, right down the street from uh, Dante's. Uh, cafe, which is when I lived in New York, that's where I would go for you. See these guys all the time. Uh, I told you the other night about a, a couple stories about Sammy the Bull and uh, John Gotti. Um, so we're gonna keep this rolling here, but this is all out in front of the Ravenite Social Club FBI. Footage. This is when John Gotti reportedly promoted him to capo. He eventually became boss of 18th Avenue in Brooklyn until he was jailed in 1994 after which his nephew, Frank Kelly, took over operations. But no matter what crew John was in back then, he was still the man pulling the strings in the big business of drug trafficking. Although narcotics trafficking was John's main business, he also owned many legitimate businesses, including... Uh, yeah, Lynn, absolutely. Uh, Traficante, uh, Vinny the Chin, we're going to... Uh you know go uh, across the board um even talk about uh al capone lucky luciano we're going to talk about some of those origins as well and, and where those came from and uh 
and uh, even a little bit of a crossover of people like Myron Lansky and the people that uh, business was done with, um, you know, but yeah, you know, you, you got Vinny the Chin and, and people like that that are very, very interesting parts of uh, mafia history. So we're definitely going to get, you know, um, Costello, Fat Tony Salerno, uh, you know, and guys like Quack Quack and, um, you know. Construction firms and others in the U.S. and abroad. In 1966, he and Joe opened a meat market in Brooklyn called G&J Meat Market, where their father is correct, Tommaso Joel. also worked. The market was later renamed San Juan Meat Market. Tommaso also operated the Italian Kansas City Village Nile. restaurant in Queens. Around the same time, in 1966, John opened Cafe Valentino on 18th Avenue in Bensonhurst. It was the same building which housed Cafe Giardino, which he later jointly owned with Joe. The original name of Cafe Giardino was Cafe Milano. Either way, Cafe Giardino became John's main base of operations and would later be the site of his law enforcement headaches in the late 1980s. At one point, the FBI called the Cafe Giardino the Pentagon of the U.S. Sicilian drug trade, and it was believed that John and his extended family in Sicily was the single most potent family in Cosa Nostra. In fact, Claire Sterling, in her book Octopus, said that one Sicilian prosecutor estimated the Gambino, Inzerillo, and Spatola holdings in Palermo were worth about $1 billion. It seems that money generated in the U.S. was sent back to Sicily to be invested in legitimate businesses, such as the construction industry and real estate. Absolutely, Joel. In 1971... Joel. Gambino bought a cattle breeding station in the state of Barinas, Venezuela. But I got to tell you, <clears throat> as far as this Mafia Monday, we're talking about Italians, all right? We're not talking about Whitey Bulger. No, actually, you know what? I just saw, uh, funny you should say that, Joel, because I just saw a whole documentary on Whitey Bulger that was on uh, Prime. It's actually quite good. I forget. Um, I think it's just called Whitey. Um there's a few of them about him, but I actually just saw it yesterday. So it's funny that you should mention him. Uh, great. Um, oh, and he, that was the inspiration for Jack Nicholson's character, in fact, in uh, The Departed. The Departed, if you ever saw that. So, yeah, uh, what a great character, Whitey Bulger. Great story, amazing story. But, hey, sorry for him. He's not Italian. <laughs> but we'll, we, we might talk about him uh we might do an episode of like, you know, like guys like Meyer Lansky and Whitey Bulger. We might, you know, because they were kind of crossover guys. But Whitey kind of like did his own thing. And, you know, it was all about the FBI. In fact, he was listed on the board of directors for many corporations in Venezuela through his association with the Contreras brothers. In 1972, <laughs> John formed hell. Father and Son's Pizza we'll Corporation call Colby in official. Pennsylvania and opened three shops in Philadelphia with both his brothers and his father. Joe and Rosario would later That's Philadelphia, open additional by the way. pizza joints and restaurants throughout the South New Jersey and Philadelphia areas. According to an El Espresso article published in 1984, John himself actually owned an estimated 240 pizzerias throughout the United States that brought in nearly $200 million a year in legitimate profits. Oof, that's a lot of pizza. And he had many other My businesses goodness, in New what Jersey, the including the A.W. Aspen Construction Company, Commonwealth Contractors and Developers, and Genova Pizzeria, all of which he owned in partnership with his two brothers, his brother-in-law Erasmo, Antonio Inzerillo, Francesco Bettelamente, and Salvatore Menino. Yeah, um... Armand Asante and John Travolta both have played John Gotti. Both did a great job, I think. Uh, you know, I enjoyed both uh, pictures, but uh, Armand Asante was more like this. He was more like, hey, well, fuck yourself. All right, uh, well, fuck the fuck out of here. You know, he was like tougher, but he played like an earlier John Gotti, whereas John Travolta played this like whole span of his life or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Hey, what's up, Tim? What's up, everybody coming over here from Cold Beer, CBC, Cold Beer Confessional? Uh, you know, the uh, well, fucking, what, Tennessee, the Tennessee Titan? All of these men, know. by the way, 
were from John's hometown of Palermo. Towards the middle of 1975, he formed G&G Concrete in Brooklyn with Anthony Genovese. Now, this is what you have to understand about when people talk about... Uh, when people talk about Trump and people talk about, you know, look, Donald Trump built a lot of buildings in Manhattan. You do not pour a drop of the old concrete, right, without the mob involved in New York. So, look, everybody, what they need to know about Trump is, uh, is that, you, you know, when you're a real estate developer, if you want to make an omelet, let me tell you something, people. You got to break a few fucking eggs. All right. And Donald Trump, let's just say he's very good at making omelets. Okay. So some eggs have been broken in the process. So let's just all get real about that. <laughs> and, uh, wow, man, pizza places make, that's a lot of pizza. When legal problems started mounting in the 80s, the company moved from Fucking Brooklyn pizza. to New Jersey. Since G&G shared their profits with the Genovese family, it made it easier to move into the Genovese-controlled Hudson River waterfront. But the move didn't help much. U.S. District Attorney Rudy Giuliani There's had Rudy. already started investigating the company after it was revealed to be mob-controlled during the commission trial of 1986. When it moved across the river, New Jersey State Police... Rudy Giuliani is one of the uh, people who drafted the... Um... RICO Act, uh, which is the Racketeering Influence uh, Corrupt Organizations Act um, with the Mafia and, you know, which has to do with not just the crime, but how much, how many broken eggs in a cow zone? Probably like one, because you make a lot of dough with one egg. And I think in a cow zone, uh, y you're not going to use any eggs anyway. You're just going with water, yeast, uh, flour. You know, like that. You just gotta, you just gotta toss it around. You just gotta, you just gotta uh, yank the uh, dough into the right place, right? Started their own investigations. Genovese was being probed by New Jersey police <laughs> get, around get 1988, soon after the company had completed a 34-story condo complex at Newport in Jersey City. In an interesting side note, mob rat Frank Frankie Fat Fapiano testified during Peter Gotti's 2004 conspiracy trial that G&G Concrete had made $22 million helping build the Metropolitan Detention Center in the early 1990s. Home of Jeffrey G &G Epstein. Was dissolved in September 1995, according to the New York Department of Let's State. Let's say final not home. Not long after John was sent to jail. John was also linked by DEA officials to G&G Tile Company, which was also located on 18th Avenue in Brooklyn. I don't think so, Char. a few doors down from the Cafe Valentino and close to his concrete business. G&G Tile Company closed in 1980 after a huge amount of heroin seized in Italy was found packaged and ready to ship to that location. Law enforcement considered the building a major center for receiving heroin shipments from Italy. This was part of the Sicilian Connection case of that time, not to be confused with the more infamous Pizza Connection case of the late 80s. Which John we're going suspected, to talk about. But never implicated in either case. Whoops. What the and we mustn't forget John's involvement in the Michelle Sendona affair of 1979, the year before things really started to unravel. Or his ties to his father's good friend Tommaso Buscetta, pre-informant days, who would surprisingly come into play when the cards fell for John in the 90s. There's an old idiom that says blood is thicker than water. For Italians, it's a saying that's taken very seriously. You're damn right. But when you're a made man in the mafia, you have a new blood family that might not include those that you share a bloodline with. However, for John, he had the best of both worlds. And there was no one closer to him than his two brothers, Rosario and Joe, who made their way to Cherry Hill to set up base. In addition, 
there was a host of other players who were very important to his Hold business. Hold on, we're going to go back here. So I want to show you guys something because there's something important that uh, maybe was a detail that was sort of like not mentioned or missed here. But when you're a made man in the mafia, um, you have a new see this right here. This is a those that you share a okay. bloodline with. So just to give you a little bit of a background of what this effigy that is being burned is all about is when you are made, there is a uh, ceremony. In this ceremony, you are to cut yourself and you can see a drop of blood. Uh, I believe that's a drop of blood right by what it looks like hair or blood or whatever. Anyway, part of the ceremony. I don't know if they actually had the blood on this or fake blood or whatever. Anyway, yes. It's like, usually it is not Jesus. It's like the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Mother, or like something like that. Because what, you're, what you say is after you bleed on this card and you light it on fire, you put that burning card in your hand and you say that you're, you know, if you break your oath to the family, uh, the oath is to the family before your wife, before your children, before your mother, before your father, before everything. Uh, comes a family and as you are taking this burning piece of paper this burning effigy in your hand you're juggling like this and you're saying you know may my soul burn like this you know thing uh if i ever break my oath you know essentially you know don't be a rat blood in blood out this is the this is the blood in part literally Kabish, let's move on now you're made now you're all made in the uh in the veritas mafia so this is very much like the uh uh it's very much like the scott mckay purple heart it uh is stupid and it doesn't mean anything it really shouldn't be said and i'm just joking and i take it back thank you however for john he had the best of both worlds and there was no one closer to him than his two brothers rosario and joe who made their way to cherry hill to set up base in addition, there was a host of other players who were very important to his business at hand, Gabish. including Lorenzo Menino. He was perhaps John's closest friend. Okay, Lorenzo Menino, and then there was, okay, so Jenny Menino went to, like, the Catholic school near me, and Jenny Menino was like, I, I had a thing for Jenny Menino. And uh, well, we'll just we'll talk about this part later. That's in probes, in a probes, confidant and associate outside his brothers. Okay, so I'll just tell you this story real quick. No, I'm not. No, I don't think I could tell this story. It's Lorenzo was born in Toretta, Italy, and came to the U.S. as a child. Law enforcement officials described him as John's nephew and bodyguard, and it's believed he started working for John when he was 17 years old and was part of the Brooklyn crew. There is no doubt that Menino was a protege of John Gambino. Menino was arrested in the raid on Cafe Giardino in December 1980. Menino, Gambino, Giardino, are you seeing a theme here? Gambino. He was charged with narcotics trafficking, gambling, and loan sharking on behalf of John and Joe since at least the mid. Well, you know, I asked uh, Jenny who could I turn to. Um, I told her that she gave me something um, I could hold on to um, and that I found her number uh, on the wall. And what people didn't realize is that I actually said on the stall because I found her in a bathroom stall and it was right next to this like weird, mm, I don't know, it was kind of like a hole cut in the bathroom stall. I don't know. It was weird. Anyway, <laughs> and that was that was just like that was just a bathroom in my high school. Okay, nineteen eighties. Police believed he was a who highly respected associate of the Gambino family, who had been proposed for formal membership shortly before his arrest. In nineteen ninety three, Menino was fingered by turncoat Sammy Gravano. Okay, all, all I can say. <laughs> So I just thought I heard something funny. Hold on. He'd been proposed for formal membership shortly before his arrest. In 1993, Menina was fingered by turncoat Sammy Gravano. <laughs> no, as a participant no, it wasn't by Sammy Gravano. 
<laughs> Prosecutors sensationalized the raid on his home when they said they found an assassin's kit containing a ski mask, guns, and hollow-tipped bullets in his bedroom. In 1994, okay. Menino pled guilty to racketeering, conspiracy to murder, and drug trafficking and received a 15-year sentence after a plea bargain. Domenico and Emmanuel and exactly. Anita. The brothers Domenico and Emmanuel were childhood friends of the Gambinos in Palermo. Emmanuel was also related to John through marriage. He lived close to Rosario and Joe and Delran, New Jersey, within walking distance to their homes there. New Jersey police believed Emmanuel was a soldier in John's crew. He was also believed to have been John's main heroin courier and to have been a chauffeur. And there was still Bush in like the early 80s. Like Bush didn't go away until the late 80s, early 90s. And then it didn't exactly go away. It became like the landing strip or, or the trim thing, right? And then it went to full, you know, it went to full, you know, down to the floors. No carpet. For Paolo Gambino, Emmanuel operated the Piancone Pizza Parlor in New Jersey, and he and his brother also owned Penn Pizza Palace in Pensacola. Penn's he was Pizza arrested Palace several in times Pensacola? Are you kidding? 1979 through 1988 in both Italy and the U.S. for various drug smuggling schemes that involved both Joe and Rosario. He was also a non-indicted co-conspirator in the Pizza Connection case. Domenico Adamita came to the U.S. in 1960 and worked as a cab driver, in addition to owning various pizza parlors with his brother. He also owned Casanova's Ristorante in Atlantic City, which police believed was a front for Joe and Rosario, and in effect, John. The Contrera brothers. John was closely affiliated with the brothers Pasquale, Paolo, and Gaspari Contrera. They were a significant part of his drug trafficking network. He owned land in Venezuela where the Contreras were located, as well as his cattle breeding farm. Many other high-ranking mafiosi involved in heroin trafficking were part of these companies as well, including Salvatore Greco, the alleged former head of the Sicilian Cosa Nostra, Antonio Napoli, a very close friend of John's, Nick Rizzuto of Montreal's Catroni Rizzuto family, as well as Joe Bono of the Bonanno family, among many others. He was also on the board of directors of many of the Contreras' businesses, which included almost everything from construction to meatpacking to travel agencies and shirt factories. The Contrera brothers were eventually banished from Venezuela and convicted in Italy. Well, you know what? It's funny you should say that, uh, Shady, because these are um, <clears throat> um, they're still dumbs, okay? So just know that they're still dumbs, but they are not uh deep underground military bases they're deep underground mafia bases mafia bunkers deep underground mafia bunkers babe two b's dumps with two b's <laughs> Gabish, i'm gonna teach everybody italian on drug trafficking charges frank Kelly. John's nephew through marriage, he was married to an Inzerillo. LCN Bios reported that Kelly took over John's 18th Avenue crew when John I went to jail in 1994. I, I think Later, the cats on the Kelly video. was believed to have been the major liaison in the Sicily to New York drug trade. He was brutally murdered in front of his home in 2019. Dominic Cephalou. Cephalou, who was born in Sicily, is believed by authorities to have taken the reins of the Gambino family in 2011. He allegedly reported to John D'Amico during Gotti's reign, was sponsored into the family by Pasquale Conti, and was a mentor to Frank Kelly. Federal law enforcement by John bing. Gambino was a key advisor to Cephalou. Tommaso Inzerillo. He was a close associate and key player in the drug trade. Tommaso was a cousin to Salvatore Inzerillo and a brother-in-law to John Gambino. Rosario Spatola and his brothers Vincenzo and Antonio. They were cousins and close associates of John Gambino and his brothers in the drug trade as well as the Michelle Sendona affair. Spatola's father was the brother of John Gambino's mother. Do you know what the phrase to be shanghai means? Where do you think 
trap doors went. Who invented the underground tunnels? Ladies and gentlemen. Whoops. <laughs> who invented the deep under? Who invented underground tunnels? What happens when you get Shanghai? A trap door. You go where? Underground. Into what? A tunnel. Takes to a ship. That's the first trafficking. Being Shanghai. Kidnapped. Double crossed. Hoodwinked. Bamboozled. Boom swabbled. Capiche? You see where I'm going? All right. There. Salvatore Totuccio in Zerillo. He was the head of the Paso di Regano family in Palermo and was a close associate and key player in John's drug trafficking network. He had been chosen to lead the Inzarillo clan by his uncle Rosario DiMaggio, who had retired. Inzarillo had been married to a Spatola. We'll get and to his that cousin in a second, but I can't Gaby believe you wife. found that. Inzarillo emoji. was shot in the face and killed in May 1981. Yes, Portland would be a place where Shanghai Tunnels Arena, are. Which, by the way, had a lot to do with drugs. Salvatore Toto, or the baker, Catalano. A capo in the Bonanno family who was a good friend and associate with whom John would trade product. Catalano owned Catalano's Bakery and Cafe Vitale. He was convicted and sentenced to 45 years during the Pizza Connection case. Paolo Luduca, a close associate of John's and a major player involved in the U.S. Sicilian heroin trade. He died in 2019. Frank Rappa, a close associate who reportedly worked in Jimmy Fiala's North Jersey crew. Not Singaporean. Enzo and Antonino Napoli. Enzo was a high-ranking representative of the Sicilian Mafia who worked with Gambino and was said by authorities to be one of the biggest movers of junk to the United States. Uh, not a mover of my junk, and when they mean junk, they mean heroin. And I'll tell you, this right here is, okay, let's just go over just a quick. Uh, like hand signal review this right here okay you could do there's a couple ways to do this again these are some of the hand symbols that my grandmother would use it some people say are like satanic or whatever look it's in context uh you know so you got that one it's like oh it's like what are you doing uh are you what like are you kidding me like my what what is what is your problem this could mean a bunch of different things do you know what i'm saying you know uh and then there's this like psh, like man, you could be in trouble that's bad uh there's this <laughs> you know so there's a couple different hand signals uh that that you could use uh that last one my grandfather used quite a bit. <laughs> he reportedly checked in daily with John in 1976 and 1977. It is punctuation for sure. Operation Not satanic. He was my grandmother said the rosary John every morning. The or the 21, where authorities would then tail him to John's home in exactly. Bensonhurst. They it's were a seen Giuliana. together dozens of times at the Millie Lucci, Enzi's own cafe on 18th oh, Avenue, I'm so and sorry. another terminal for many. I'm I, I can hear it in my ears, but I wasn't playing it on the screen. I apologize there. What the fuck is happening? Oh. We're going to go back just a little bit. This movers of junk just a little to the bit. United States. He reportedly checked in daily with John in 1976 and 1977 Wouldn't spoon during the FBI's Operation Earn. My grandmother was a he savage. He was also seen dining with John at the Ritz or the 21, where authorities would then tail him so to sorry. John's home in Bensonhurst. They were seen together dozens of times at the Millie Lucci, Enzi's own cafe on 18th Avenue, and another terminal for massive heroin deliveries. Even in December 1988, Enzo was regularly checking in with John and Joe Gambino at the Cafe Giardino. Antonino Napoli was part of John's innermost circle since at least the 1960s. They went to Caracas around That's the right, same the time in early 1970s the evil eye. and both became business partners with the Contrera family. Napoli moved to Venezuela to escape the French My connection would do investigation. That. Not much. He also helped Tommaso Buscetta to establish himself in New York when he arrived and they became partners at several <laughs> pizzerias. Michelle Sendona, 
the infamous banker who handled the Gambino's cash. And there were many, many more involved with John in the drug trafficking business. The Gambino family faction, known as the Cherry Hill Gambinos, didn't start out in Cherry Hill. After arriving in the U.S. in the early 60s, John and his immediate family members settled in Brooklyn. But in 1972, John's parents, yeah. sister, and both his brothers packed up their bags and moved to Dalran, New Jersey. John had purchased homes for them there for $100,000 each. He paid in cash. He also stayed behind in Brooklyn and ran a separate crew from there. A suburb of Philadelphia, Delran is an idyllic little town full of parks and restaurants, tree-lined streets, and green open spaces. It's the perfect escape from the hustle and bustle of the big city. Cherry Hill is a short eight-minute drive away, and Brooklyn is only a one-and-a-half-hour drive away. How about that, Sugar Hill It's gang? also only an hour away from Atlantic City. At the time, Atlantic City, which had seen better days, was considering legalizing casino gambling in an effort to revitalize the city. Now, it was a big deal that Je Atlantic City, remember Atlantic City, Trump building in Atlantic City, uh, generated excitement, but also a lot of dread for its residents. You just have to understand the roots and the, and the origins the potential of becoming an open before city people for start, you know, crime. tickling this guy's an arrangement fucking balls because. Uh, I'm getting sick of it, and uh, I'm. I think I'm going to um, call up. Um, uh, we're going to have to call up Dirty Trump in a little while, uh, probably sometime this week. Uh, I think we can have uh, Dirty Trump get on Will Show as well uh, to make an appearance. But uh, I know Dirty Trump has some things to say about some of the crazy shit uh, that's been going on online families to divvy up the action it's very serious whether that was the reason why john sent his family there in an attempt to position themselves i don't know what's so fucking ass, funny is anyone's Sorry. guess he it. might have just wanted to offer a delicious pizza pie to the residents of south jersey oh. philadelphia and the surrounding areas who doesn't want a pizza pie however according to a 1978 courier post article an unidentified sci source New Jersey State Commission of Investigation. Cannoli, Schwedel, Schwedel's good. As for the Schwedel, the Gambinos didn't come to South Jersey because of Atlantic City, but because of pizza parlors and business opportunities. The source added that pizza parlors were a good way to launder cash, and as the world discovered during the 1980s Pizza Connection case, a great way to facilitate narcotic smuggling. All right, guys. So. We're going to wrap it up in a bow. <laughs> Just like that. I hope you enjoyed what we was doing here today. Wait, I got to go over here. There we go. I hope you enjoyed the program today. Make sure you hit that like button. And if you have not subscribed, make sure you hit subscribe. Hit that notification bell because we are going to be doing this once a week. And I'm going to be doing some other themed programs uh, over the next month or so, I have a couple ideas that uh, I'm going to lay down. And if you guys want to hear something in particular, if there are any mafia people, any mob guys, any mob stories, any mob stuff that you're curious about, go ahead and hit me up on the old Instagram and Twitter. Uh, feel free to DM me either one of those. You can search me there at the Veritas Machine. Uh, I'm also on Twitch, but I don't really, I don't think, never mind. Just Instagram's even better. All right. Uh, I am on Facebook, streaming there now, but uh, I'm not on there uh, much. So that's the best way to get in touch with me. But I would love to hear from you guys, and I would love to hear your ideas. And if, like I said, if you want to hear about somebody in particular, i got a lot of people in mind, but uh, let's hear what you got. And join me, please, next week on Mafia Mondays. Thank you so much for joining me. Make sure you smash that like button. Thank you so uh, much, Will, for uh, kicking it over here tonight thank you all much for the meat hammer nation you should be subscribed to both channels by now so hit that sub hit that like go ahead and share this out with people they're gonna love it this is the good stuff so until next time all right we're gonna keep bringing some great stuff and we hope you see you here we we hope you <laughs> hope we see you here again on the next one until then Full set.
the truth, the truth, set the truth, set you free, set you free. Thank you so much for joining me here. I really appreciate you guys coming on over. Make sure you share this out. I think next week we're going to do some more stuff about the bosses, the burrows, the hits and the history. In an age of universal deceit, telling the truth, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. It's a revolutionary act. And the rise of power of the Sicilian Mafia in the U.S. and around the world. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I wrote this, by the way. I hope you guys like the music and the theme song. Until then.